For over two decades, hard swimming fish of Frederick, Maryland have been fusing together blues, jazz, funk, and swing, stirring it into their own spicy brew that is familiar yet wholly their own. Super excited to be here with Demian Lewis, the guitarist and vocalist of Hearts Women Fish. Demian, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. We were talking a little bit before this started that, you know, we've had you a couple times at Brightbox. It's always been a different experience, so it's, uh, you're always a band to look out for when I see you coming. It's always something new. I appreciate it. We love playing there. It's a great, great spot, great stage, always a good crowd. Yeah, so that's one of the things for people who don't know you. The band is described as twisted vintage roots music. Can you share with me where that comes from and, you know, some of your influences, what brings us to that? Yeah, I mean, most of, most of our, our sort of like signature stuff is uh, sort of just happened organically. We had been a uh, primarily acoustic band for, for quite a while, and we were doing, for a long time, we said, like our, uh, our sort of tagline was old time blues show. And then when we started getting more electric again, we realized it, it's not really old timey anymore. And I'm not exactly sure how to describe it. So we, uh, we put it out to the fans on Facebook and, um, that was one of the suggestions. And, uh, we thought, well, that, that pretty much sums it up right there. You know? Well, and it's, it's true to it because when you listen to it, there's, like you said, there's influences, there's different things that make you stand out in a very unique, but like authentic way. And, um, you know, for some other bands that might just be tag words, but I mean, I think those are, I think that sums you guys up in a good way. I think your fans did a good job with that. Yeah, it seemed, it seemed appropriate because, um, we certainly have, a you know, I, I think our ethos is, is very much, uh, traditional music, but, um, but you can't ignore the fact that, you know, there's been a lot in between, you know, the 1950s and, you know, Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters and today, you know, and at the same time, we've got, you know, particularly our rhythm section is, um, you know, steeped in, in jazz and world music and stuff like that. And, and, you know, we sort of bring that all to the, to the table when we play. Yeah, it's so cool because I've definitely caught you guys doing like an impromptu, like Black Keys cover, or like we said, we've had you play on shows that are more like 20s to 50s bass, but you guys just kind of shine no matter where you are on a set. And I think that's impressive. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean... Another part about that is is your whole aesthetic. I mean, the old-fashioned suits, the heart blows just these hurricanes through a telephone speaker. You've got the right. retro amps. You've got the unconventional drums, the upright bass. Like, there's no way to say it, but you guys just look cool. You know, you look like you fit the part. You look like you are comfortable with what you're using. You use a lot of interesting equipment. You know, can you talk to us about some of that? Like, how did some of this instrumentation come about? Like, how did this get so integrated into your sound and your look and the whole hearts women fish thing yeah the um the look started well when we first started we've been at this for almost 20 years now and um when we first started out uh i would show up to gigs and whatever i was wearing you know i'd be in like a t-shirt and work pants and and um randy the bass player suggested to me gently that perhaps i should look like i meant to be there which and, <laughs> because Randy is such a silver fox, if I can go on the record to say that. So, like, that guy is setting the bar pretty high. Exactly. He is always dapper, right? And um, so, you know, one day I just showed up to a gig. I thought I'd go all the way. I showed up to a gig in, uh, in a suit. And pretty much from then on, it had been the, the hat, you know, the tie and everything. And um, uh, so that was sort of the way the, the look evolved. And... Um, the instrumentation, again, you know, when came out of when we were playing a lot of acoustic music. So as we started to go back, I found to electric, I found the arch top um, more comfortable for me to play than like a, you know, a, going back to a Strat or a Tele or something like that. Randy was already on upright and we didn't want to change that. And um, Jason was playing that crazy drum kit that you know, with the cajon and everything. He's recently actually in this last album gone back to drum set, but um, you never know what he's going to do. So, and, and Waverly's, uh, I wish I could remember the name of the harmonica player that Waverly got the idea for the telephone from, but um, yeah, he, he sort of brought that with him and, uh, and it was great for like our stripped down shows, you know, because you could get this sort of very, very sort of dirty harp sound without, you know, running it through like a, you know, a 
lot of effects or anything like that. So when it, it worked out well because it just it works. I think it's the best way to say right. it. When, when you're loading in on the stage, you're not sure what to expect, and then, like I said, whether it's a cover or one from one style or another, it all blends together almost because of all the unique pieces. You know, like you said, like it's just not jazz, it's just not blues, it's just not swing. It's just it's a beast of its own, and I think it kind of shows on every aspect of it which i think is just wholly appropriate for it cool yeah i mean i think we we all try and allow enough space for everyone to bring in their own influences and uh and make that work together you know um and i've got to give randy credit he is responsible for a great deal of our aesthetic uh, he builds the amps those cool amps so waverly's uh zenith radio amp and my suitcase amps um and, uh, you know, he also does our graphic design and our T-shirts and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, I don't think I can give him too much credit. And these days he's doing our sound engineering too. So, Well, and that's what I've noticed with a lot of bands, especially when you've got your own sound and your own setup, is no one knows it better than you. And the more DIY and the more self-sufficient bands become, I think that almost, like, gives you some room, like you said, to grow in your own ways and uh, have your own sound and know that you can make it work and... You know, it's just amazing that he's your he's your tech. You know, you're never going to be on the road and something doesn't work. No one will know to fix it better than him, and I think that's really impressive. Yeah, exactly. Randy, I need a tube. <laughs> you know, that's awesome. Well, and speaking of influences, you know, your 2013 album One Step Forward was produced by Mitch Easter, and he's yeah. worked with Ben Folds Five. He's worked with Pavement, Suzanne Vega, REM. Like the list just goes on and on. So, you know, what was that experience like working with him? It was fantastic. We actually recorded two albums with him. We did uh, One Step Forward and True Believer at his place down in North Carolina. Um, Fidelitorium Studios is the name of his stu of his, uh, his place down there, and he's got a guest house. So, I mean, beyond the studio itself being, like, an extremely cool place just to be and to record, and the fact that he's got every microphone like, it seems like he's got every microphone that was ever made, you know, and he knows exactly what he wants for to get each sound. Um, you know, the, the guest house allowed us to sort of, you know, after the sessions get together and collaborate, decide what we wanted to do, you know, and rewrite things. So it was a great experience. And, um, he's a really cool down to earth guy. Um, funny, easy to work with, you know, um, but actually, after two uh, doing two records with him, um, we liked what we were doing, but we um, decided we wanted a more old-timey kind of sound, um, a little bit more of the old, almost chess records kind of sound. Um, so this last record we did down at uh, uh, Big Tone Studios in uh, Bristol, Tennessee, and... Um, and we're pretty pretty pleased with the uh, with the outcome of that. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, I think it's important, like you said, that you did two records with Mitch, and you're you're happy with it. But then you wanted to keep exploring your sound. And again, the way you guys evolve with sound, it's I think it's important that each record, like you said, has some of its own tone or its own texture, its own flavor, for lack of better words. And right. um, that's awesome. So. Knowing that you've now worked with both of them, are there other artists or producers you want to work with? Is this like a, a growing list of a uh, bucket list you're going to check off? Uh, not exactly. Actually, one one of the main things that came out of working at Big Tone Studios is that um, Randy again just uh, decided that he he had to have these all, all of these uh, the amps and microphones and stuff like that and and um, he had his own studio out uh, out on his property in West Virginia already, and now it's it's transformed into a you know a sort of a retro type of operation. And um, you know, I I would imagine our next record will probably just do out there with him because he's got pretty much everything we need. So again, uh, but you know, we're always open to collaboration. We we do. Uh, I mean, I'm the only person who for whom this is my only band um so you know there's sort of uh, the guys are always bringing in you know different influences and stuff like that and we get people sitting in with us and, and so that's always enjoyable 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's amazing. Again, it goes back to the whole DIY aspect of you guys bringing it in-house. And, you know, if there's ever a way that you can take all the time you need on production and sound and getting it just the way you want as a masterpiece and maybe not having to uh, refinance your house to afford the studio time, I think it's definitely a a key time to work with Randy and, like you said, to just bring it all in-house. I don't know if there's a better way to do it, ultimately. I think a lot of artists end up that way. Yeah. There's a balance to be uh, sought there where, um, you know, obviously if you've got, you know, you've got four days, five days or something like that, um, and that's all you've got, then you sort of have to uh, maybe, um, you know, compromise on performance sometimes. You maybe didn't play the song exactly how you would have wanted to, um, but it's good enough because you have you got to move on to the next thing. Um but also, when you have that uh, the concentrated time where you're like, we're all together here, because we live all over the place. You know, I'm in Loudoun County, Randy's in West Virginia, Jason's near Washington, D.C., and Waverly's all the way down in Charlottesville. So um, getting us all together it usually only happens at gigs. So, um, you know, we like to have that sort of uh, dedicated time where, you know, here is we're we're all together. We're working on this project. You know, um, it's just that if we're doing it ourselves, maybe we can say, okay, we didn't get it quite done. You know, we'll schedule another you know recording session in you know a couple of weeks and try it again. So. Well, I mean, I think that's important to note is that with all of you kind of all over the place when you get together, that your energy is so concise like that. You know, like. Every time I've seen you at Brightbox, if I had to guess, you guys practiced every single day together. So I think that's another thing about <laughs> camaraderie and that energy you have and that it's kind of lightning in a bottle that you can get together and, and knock it out when you need to or you can get together and really put a product together because you know each other and, and your workflow is so complimentary. Right. Uh, it's a sort of a running joke because people will ask us, well, if you live that far away from each other, how do you practice? And the answer is that we don't. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's technology helps this because if like, oh, I write a new song or something like that, I can, you know, put down a real scratch recording, send it out to Randy or, you know, he and I are actually fairly close so we can get together and maybe do a scratch track and send it to Jason and Waverly so that they know what we're working with when we go into the, you know, the next gig. And then frankly, we're basically polishing it at the gigs, you know, Um, but We've been playing together for a long time. I mean, this band has been together for a long time, but um, Randy and Jason and I have actually known each other pretty much our entire lives and have been playing together since we were teenagers. So um, That's awesome. So, so that's the question. You know, we've got these other albums that have came out. You're constantly writing, whether it's together or separate. You're getting together at shows. You're harnessing that energy. So, you know, what's next for Heart Swimming Fish? What's, what's coming up in the pipeline? What are we looking for for the next year or so with you? I'll tell you, I mean, I think, all, <laughs> I think all of us are wondering what's next at this point, right? Um, but uh, I can give you all some credit for, um, for I think, what we're going to be working on in the immediate future because we had such a great time uh, recording the songs for this, for this series, um, and they turned out so well that um, I think what you're going to see in the coming months is us uh, recording and releasing singles rather than, you know, waiting for the entire album to be together, you know, all together. But, um, yeah, I mean, we were, you know, really pleased with what we got. So Um, I'm super happy about it. Like I said, everyone seeing this interview will see the songs, you know, right after this. And I think our comment section will reflect that, that I think everyone's going to be impressed with what they're hearing. So, you know, I'm excited to, to have the world hear some of them first with us, for sure. Yeah, I, I'm really pleased with and thankful for this uh, this opportunity because it's it's really turned out well. And uh, you know, the the audio, I think you know, Randy was engineering the audio, and that I think that turned out great. But Jason is our our cinematographer, so let me give him a shout out for that. Perfect. Well, again, I really thank you for being here, you know, answering these questions, providing such good content for us both live and here on the, on the, uh, the web stream. And, uh, you know, the next time I'll see you is on the stage, and I can't wait. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. We can't wait to be there in person. Thanks a lot, Josh. See you soon. Be well. You too. Okay, here we go. Here's a song from our most recent 
CD called Misspent Youth Based on a True Story.
Marsh Moving Fish. Very happy to be here virtually at the Bright Box Theater. Here is the first single from our most recent CD. It don't get no better than this. I'm here with Rob Towton of Atlantic Union Bank. Rob, tell us a little bit about the bank. Hey, Josh, I'm Rob Talton. I'm Vice President and Business Banking Relationship Manager for Atlantic Union Bank and proud to help our customers in the Winchester, Front Royal, and Rappahannock County markets. Um, Atlantic Union Bank's roots uh, in Virginia go back to 1902. And uh, since then, we've grown to become the largest regional bank headquartered in the Commonwealth because we put our customers first and our and we make banking easier, hopefully, in the process. Um, we understand that, that financial services is about much more than money. And at the heart of every banking transaction is a real person, someone who dreams of buying a house or starting a business or saving for retirement. And we're also neighbors and proud to support great organizations like the Bright Box Theater, as well as the arts in our community that help enrich the Winchester community. And if you're looking for a different kind of bank, a different kind of experience, a different kind of feel, um, and true relationship banking, then I would be honored to discuss uh, that with you and uh, to see how we can help. So again, as a uh, being a musician myself um, and, and having a, such a, a, a wonderful connection to the Bright Box, um, like we couldn't be more thrilled to, to, help, to help any way that we can. Well, guys, you've heard it from him first. Rob, thanks so much for checking in. 
Thank you. Dubbed as the original Bad Boys of Bethesda, blues rock legend the Nighthawks have been around since the 70s with over 20 albums under their belt. Their high-energy shows pack the house every time they play the Bright Box, and I couldn't be more excited to be speaking to founding member Mark Winter today. Mark, thanks for joining us. Good day, sir. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Can't complain about the weather. I'm trying to stay positive. That's about all I can do. Good, good, good. So I got to ask. Being a band for nearly 50 years, you have to have some great memories. Could you share one or two of those with us? Ooh, uh, one or two. Well, one of my proudest moments was uh, we had a, a, a great relationship with Muddy Waters uh, for almost a decade, uh, his, his, la his last decade. But um, there was a moment... Uh, we would open shows sometimes for a week at the cellar door and uh, on the road. We did a lot of work together. We had the same booking agency and we had a PA, which made it uh, easy for us to open a show at a college and use our PA without having to pay for it. But uh, we were doing a week at the cellar door in DC and um, the, the band came, most of the band came down from Chicago, but there was a north nor'easter winter storm in Boston where Jerry Portnoy lived. Uh, Margolin was from Boston too, but he was down staying with us anyway in D.C. Uh, so Jerry was snowed in for a couple of days. So the first night of the run uh, might have been Charlottesville first and then the week at the cellar door. Margol, Bob Margolin came to me and said, the old man wants to talk to you. I said, what, what, what? He said, uh, just, just ask, just go ask. You know, he didn't want to let the cat out of the bag. So I went in, Muddy was sitting in the dressing room, and I went in and uh, he said, Mark, can you do me a favor? Uh, of course I would do him a favor. Uh, whatever you need, sir. And he said, now Jerry is snowed in and he's not going to be able to make it. Can you play harp in my show tonight? Well, <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, there was no, not, no discussion of money or anything. He didn't want to pay me or anything, but I wasn't concerned about that at all. So I would do two nights in a row. I did the Nighthawk set and then ran upstairs, wiped my face off, ran downstairs. And the Muddy's band would do songs before he came out. The one or two guys would sing a song or two. But the opening number was a harmonica instrumental. So it wasn't like I got up there and kind of hid in the background to get acclimated. It was like, bam, you're on. No uh, pressure, right? And, and Muddy had heard me play from, you know, upstairs kind of, but he never interacted with me. We played, I sat in with him, but he still didn't have a, that direct sense of me playing his show. And he was very complimentary after the first time. And I think I got two or three nights out of it before Jerry showed up. And I was not that pleased to see him, but uh, uh, it was also easier to relax and just do the night off set again. Uh, but I would say that's, that's my biggest, greatest, wonderful memory. I got to play with a lot of great people, um, a who's who of the blues in the 70s and 80s. Everybody, from, you know, from Greg Allman and Bonnie Raitt to uh, uh, a lot of the great Chicago guys, Jimmy Dawkins and Big Walter Horton. And, um, but I put Muddy up at the tippy top of the, of the list. Yeah, I don't think anyone would fault you for that. And I think that camaraderie is so important, and I think that really makes certain genres – tight-knit and family-like and you know i think that for me is you know i'll discover one artist and then i'll discover a slew of other artists based on who they've played with or who they've jammed with or right. you know if they're a feature on an album you know and i know even local bands have said before you know i heard that harmonica part and i knew it was mark you know i know <laughs> you and i have talked about that is you get a style and you get friendships and you get that camaraderie and it really makes for a whole scene that's just amazing especially in those days when you would do a week in a club so you would be backstage. There's a degree of friendship. It's like you're on the works. You're on the job site together. 
So you, you're having eating together, you're hanging out between the shows. You just end up after a couple of days with a special camaraderie that uh, is, is way different from being the kid that walks in, can you sign my album? I really like you, you know. Um, and uh, it led with us and Muddy's band, we did uh, uh, several recordings. There's a, two albums called Jackson Kings that after the, we had a situation where after the shows at the cellar door, and at night we'd finish up at 12 o'clock or something, we would go to a studio in Silver Spring and play till dawn. And we recorded all this stuff, you know, 16 track, whatever number of tracks, and mixed it and made a couple of albums out of it. Uh, the Jackson Kings concept, Muddy had done in the 60s had done some recordings called Fathers and Sons, where some of Muddy's guys and then younger guys like Paul Butterfield and James Cotton um, playing with Muddy. And I followed that when it, I read about it when it happened and waited for that album to come out, uh, you know, like it was Christmas was coming or something. Uh, so we chose Jackson Kings as the, as the theme uh, for ours, but... I mean, what a what an opera, lifetime opportunity to be involved in that stuff. It's crazy to hear, and it's amazing to hear that you say you would play till one or two a.m. when the bar closed, and then go record. Because you know, the next question I have for you is, is you've already earned the title, but you know, you've been called one of the hardest working bands in America, and you know, the stories like that just kind of illuminate that. You know, can you talk about how playing blues has changed for you over time? You know, the decades of your life and the time that you spent playing. Well, I don't work as hard as I used to, that's for sure. There was a, a strong period, uh, mid-70s to mid-80s, where we did 300-plus days a year. And then even after that, well, there were some disruptions in, in the flow, but we kept up a pretty uh, pretty rigorous pace, and we're not doing anything. I'm maybe doing 150 to 200 shows during normal times. Uh, and most, a lot of them are drive home stuff. Uh, we would go out, and we would leave DC and drive like to Chicago to, to Denver to Salt Lake City to watch the, uh, Seattle, Washington and drive all the way down the coast to San Diego and then drive all the way back through Texas and New Orleans and take like a month to do that. Uh, one time in the middle of that, we left California, flew to Japan, did a week, flew back to California and drove home. So um, we don't do anything like that anymore. In fact, I think what ruined my, 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 most of my physical ailments are based on spending that much time sitting in a van. Uh, and one of the worst things you can do to your body is sit in a van for eight hours a day. Uh, no regrets though, right? No, no regrets. It was worth it. So like you said, you've been playing for a while. The music you've put out is just timeless. I think a lot of your hits at shows are like one from every album sometimes, it seems. If I didn't know the Nighthawks and I was just diving in, is there an album or two in your discography that you recommend? Is, is there one or two that is just pinnacle Nighthawks in your personal opinion? A new one. We have a brand, a real album came out this spring. It's kind of fighting against the uh, lockdown. But doing well, it's number four this month on the Living Blues radio chart, which in, in my field, that's like the Billboard Top 40. Um, and uh, the band, the Proven Ones, are number five with Kid Rama. So I'm kind of just, I sent him a little note. Hey, we're ahead of you. Got to play catch up, yeah. Uh, it's, a it's a really an album I'm very, very, very proud of. Um, the Jackson Kings, especially Volume 1, historically is an album I'm extremely proud of. It gives you an insight into how a younger generation and an older generation of people loving the blues can interact, where we took guys who were somebody, most, they had their own thing, but they were working as Muddy Waters' backup band, and then we became their backup band and put the spotlight on them. And... Uh, I, it was at a time when there was a little lull in interest in the blues, wasn't quite so uh, prominent as it is today. And I think we helped 
with that spark a whole another generation of uh, that kind of thing. Um, there's uh, a number of albums we did that I think are pretty cool. Uh, our very first album is called Rock and Roll. And uh, that, that uh, was a, uh, almost a uh, blueprint for everything else we ever did. It was the concept of reinventing rock and roll by going back to the same root sources that rock and roll came from in the late 40s, early 50s, and taking those things again and putting them back together, almost like following uh, your grandmother's recipe for making something, you know. Yeah, I think it's important for people to know that since you were 30, 20, 30 years before. Well, and that's the thing. Since you were playing front since the 70s, a lot of the fusions of styles you did wasn't commonplace at the time. You know, a lot of that stuff you did was uh, risky, maybe, is a way to say it. <laughs> well, it's true. Um, and, and there was a period of time people had no clue what, what it was we were about, even some of the record companies we worked with. We... Uh, we did a second album for Mercury after a dismal failure of our first one. And we made an album and took it to these people. These were new people. That the company had changed drastically. And the guy went, I don't know what you've got here. You have a blues song and a rockabilly song and a soul song. I said, yeah. And, and the problem is, and they had no clue how to sell that. Plus, we didn't all have the same haircuts or, you know, the same uh, little jackets or anything. Um, in fact, we looked like we didn't even belong in the same car, much less on the same stage. Uh, but uh, it was a number of years later that the term Roots Rock popped up. Now, we weren't, never considered ourselves really a blues band. That was just the only uh, avenue, the only uh, overall large venue we could exist in. Uh, but this first album we did, an Otis Redding song, we did a Ray Charles song, we did an Elvis Presley song, we did a Little Feet song, along with some Jimmy Reed and Sonny Boy Williamson. So uh, it's like, that's, we're saying, this is what we're doing. Uh, and then we proceeded to follow that up. Um, when the, the Blasters and Los Lobos came out of California, the critics came up with a term called Roots Rock which they didn't have when we were on our first Mercury album came out. They didn't have that, so they couldn't put us in a box. And uh, by the time the term was, uh, so now we call ourselves Blues and Roots Rock. Uh, and if people understand what that means, but we fought it. We, we spent about a decade trying to tell people, well, whatever it is we do, this is what it is. It's the night off. It's American music. Uh, it's, it's something, it's, I, I tried to call it American dance music, you know, but that didn't have the, quite the ring, it, it didn't compute. The other funny thing was that early on, I knew we were trying to do a commercial thing, not sell out, but we were trying to reach a larger number of people uh, by doing a mixture of music. But we had an opportunity to record an all blues album in 76. And I said, well, this may be, we may not be able to do this in the future if we're going to try to be more commercial. So let's knock this out. Well, it got incredibly well reviewed in a number. It got reviewed in Playboy, Stereo Review, the Atlanta Constitution, uh, and it sold rather well. And um, it actually was a prototype. We had one song live from the cellar door with Pine Top Perkins sitting in. And we also got from the cellar door Muddy Waters saying, they have a beautiful name. They are the Night Hawks. And we put that in the front and back of the album, uh, which some people made us think it was a live album, but it was by nature all classic blues. Uh, and um, it, it was just, it's, it was the, the right time for that to happen. The 60s white boy blues movement had virtually disappeared. And the, seven, the, the, the 80s white boy blues music thing with Stevie Ray and I'll include Robert Cray and the Thunderbirds hadn't happened yet. And boom, here we came out with this album, these four white kids from, from D.C. playing 
straight up hard Chicago blues. Uh, so it was, it, it, people were ready for it. And there we were. Uh, so obviously we got pretty heavily labeled a blues band uh, at that point because it was way more successful than the rock and roll album. And then we proceeded to try and make more, some commercial albums. And then we put out that Jackson Kings album, which did better than anything else we had ever done. So we've always been identified and, and I'm, I'm, I don't, it's not a problem for me to be called a blues band. It's just not an accurate description. So. Well, I think it's important, like you said, to, to play the music you want to play and to play what inspires you. And then, like you said, right. let someone at a record label figure it out. <laughs> you just do what's right for you. You sell it. I'll play it. You sell it. Deal. So, I mean, I guess that begs the question, you know, there's no sign of stopping. I think you guys have proven that with your latest album that, you know, there's no lack of new material. There's no lack of passion. So what's next for the Nighthawks? Is, is it riding on this album? Is it, are you already working on the next? What's going on? Yes, we are. We have, I think we have at least a half an album ready, if not more. Um, Dan Hovey is, is writing prolifically. Mark Stutzo is writing. Uh, I'm, I'm always, I've always got a dozen neat old songs I'm trying to talk people into doing. I said, I'm not doing that. That's dumb. And then 20 years later, I get someone to do it, and it turns out fantastic. So uh, that's always been a funny little struggle for me. But uh, even... Uh, that last album, All You Gotta Do, the Brenda Lee song, was the title song on that. I brought that into a couple of different bands over the past 20, 30 years, and people said, I'm not doing that. And then the last version of the Nighthawks just clomped right into it, and it just was good enough to be the title song on the album. So, Plus, we sent it to Brenda Lee, who loved it, and autographed a copy of it and sent it back to her. So. That's, uh, that's amazing. That's some job security. If you've always got a few kicking around that you can even pull from the vault and make happen after that much time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Perfect. Well, Mark, thanks for talking with us today. The next time I'll see you is on stage and I can't wait, man. So absolutely I'm missing it, buddy. Missing it. big. Hello to everybody. We'll see you in person soon. I hope. That's right. Ash. Traveling over mountain, even through the valley too. I've been traveling like they I've been running all the way, baby, trying to get to you. Where ever since I read your letter, where you say you love me too. Traveling like day I've been running all the way Baby, trying to get to you There was nothing that could hold me That could keep me away from you Now when you love and let it show me Oh, you really love me too oh, Lord above you, I love you she who brought me through Now when my road was dark at night He would shine his spider's light I was trying to get to you
take the fun it takes to Yes, I got a lot of living to do Whole lot of love to do What do I do it with? Well. Yeah Yo, the moon is big and bright I've been the Milky Way tonight About the way you act You never would know it's love Now, baby, time's a-wasting A lot of kisses I ain't been tasting I don't know about you I'm not gonna get my shit Yes, I got a lot of living to do Whole lot of love to do Come on, baby To make it fun it takes you Yes, I got a lot of living to do And as a bomb a little breeze, I hear it whispering through the trees. It's telling you, picture a little road with me. Why don't you take a listen? You don't know what you've been missing. Cuddle up real close, think my little honey boo. I'm gonna do it. 